I'm excited about being here and anytime I can talk about nutrition and share some of the things that I've found through the years, um, and you're probably the same way if you see these patients and you see things happen, you say, gosh, I'm going to see if there's a correlation with that. So I'm going to show you some things that I've noticed over the years with certain nutrients. And one of the things that I think is so difficult when we read the literature with nutrition is we try to limit the variables. And so, you know, we've all heard recently that if you take calcium, you can have an increased chance of heart attacks. And if you take this other nutrient, it may cause this. And when I hear those things, it's kind of shocking because there's a lot of other literature that shows that that's not the case. But if we look at one nutrient that we can maybe be misled. So, I titled this, as you can see, Connecting the Nutrients because what we have found is that there are so many nutrients that are correlated to one another. And that's one of the things that really interests me about this particular testing procedure. When I was trained at Cornell, I was trained on serum and plasma and whole blood and urinalysis and the simple CBC and chemistry profiles. And when I'm treating these Crohn's patients on the GI floor and they come back with a normal CBC and a normal chemistry, I said, you know, this just can't be. These people are in this severe case of Crohn's disease and why is this nutritional status normal? So over the years, I started to look for more and more tests and actually I was training to be a forensic pathologist. I always was interested in testing procedures and, and so I'm always to this day looking for new ways of finding different things out. And this is one thing that we've seen. There's a test, of course, a spectroscopical micronutrient test and it looks at various nutrients at one time. And, you know, the, I'm going to show you a few uh, slides here with just sayings because I love quotes and I think a lot of quotes tell us certain things and I hear patients say this, something like this all the time, gosh if I knew that I should have taken care of myself better, I wouldn't be at this state, I wouldn't probably have diabetes, I wouldn't have heart disease and so on. So it's easy to say that, but what are we doing for prevention? Because I think that's really what the public wants is prevention, is how can we prevent some of these conditions or at least treat some of these conditions with the medication. I was just in the endocrine society. Uh, lecture or conference this past weekend in San Francisco and they've talked huge about vitamin D and some calcium they're looking at different things as far as food addictions and what they're doing with the brain and different communications with parts of the brain and of course nutrition came up but they didn't really go in depth with it and once again the one thing is we need to apply these things is not just know about them but are we applying it are we really telling our patients what to do and how to do it so this is a new article you can see out of the Journal of Internal Medicine 2013 that they've definitely shown a correlation with vitamin E and Alzheimer's, but it's not just that simple. Do we just go out and take vitamin E and see if we can slow down Alzheimer's? Because there's different correlations here and I'll show you that with connecting the dots is we have to look at other nutrients. Could we take vitamin E and actually cause another problem with another nutrient and some other particular conditions as well? And then we go a little further. So now we're looking at B vitamins and Alzheimer's. And you can see that in this particular study they came out with, they showed that it was looking also at homocysteine, that homocysteine was very important in this study. And of course, there's certain nutrients we know that affect homocysteine, but everybody usually jumps on the big three, folic acid, B6, and B12. And there's other nutrients that we've seen that are associated with that. So, I think we can't just look at vitamin E, we can't just look at B vitamins, that we have to look at all these nutrients at one time. And how do we do that? <clears throat> and now we look at vitamin C and we see that vitamin C has been shown to help with hypertension. There's a lot of research out there showing that calcium helps with hypertension, that magnesium helps with hypertension, CoQ10 helps with hypertension, and it goes on and on and on. So if we just go and look at one particular nutrient, are we missing out on other nutrients? And I think that's the big key with this particular uh, testing and looking at nutrition. And then, of course, vitamin D. I first got into nutrition because of exercise. I've been an athlete all my life. I went to college on football scholarship, and I wanted to do it the right way. I wanted to do nutrition. I didn't want to look into anabolic steroids or anything like that. And I ran into a PhD 
nutritionist from Arizona State University that really directed me this way. And so I'm always reading on sports and nutrition. And this is a very interesting study. Even though it was done with laboratory animals, we've seen this also in human studies that vitamin D deficiency can affect our performance. And I see this with a lot of athletes. I treat a lot of marathoners and triathletes and they often are deficient in vitamin D. And they often say, you know, I'm training, but I'm fatigued. I'm not recovering like I should. So once again, something we look at. And this is a new study that just came out is can we prevent things like this, like fibroids? Are there relationships of certain deficiencies that we can look at to really prevent some of these from happening? And one of the things that, of course, is very interesting with nutrition that I've had a fortune to see recently is women that have failed in IVFs and come to our office, we do testing on them, we support them nutritionally, and, not, and then they get pregnant with no assistance. And I have five right now that uh, two of them have gone through two IVFs and failed, and the other three have gone through one IVF and failed, and now they're all expecting to have children in the next two, three months. So once again, something that we have seen very strongly. So one of the things that I think is important is looking at some of these nutrients, and there's a lot of research out there on mechanisms, and I'm gonna show you some of these correlations. And chromium has been talked about a lot in the diabetic community as well as in weight loss. Of course, when you want to so-called lose weight, of course, what you need to do is take more chromium. That's what everybody's saying out there. And some of these fat burner supplements, if you look at them, they have chromium in them. But the point is, does that person really need chromium? And is there enough chromium in there? And what they take the chromium, is it really satisfying their cells or their needs? So once again, things that we're looking at, and you can see here, one of the measurements that we look at diabetics is of course HbA1c. Now this is a good point to talk about why we look at different testing methods. Like I said, I've been in the healthcare field for about 33 years. When I was first trained, of course, the person was diabetic, what did we look at? We looked at serum glucose. You take your serum glucose four or five times a day, or maybe you know, two hours postprandial, and go on and measure that, and that's what we're gonna see on what we should do with our insulin or our medication. And then all of a sudden, this test came out called HbA1c, and that's what everybody looks at now. Why? Because it's a long-term evaluation of the average of what our glucose is doing for three or four months. But what does that test really look at? It looks at intracellular level of a specific hemoglobin, of course we know as HbA1c. So it's a marker of long-term evaluation. We still look at serum glucose, but what we really look at, and most of your diabetic research says, look at the AB, HbA1c. So the point is that we have evolved from serum glucose to this particular test, and it's intracellular. And then, of course, you can see that also lipids have been changed with chromium as well. So we know that chrom uh, chromium can affect lipids, it can affect our glucose levels, and of course, one of the main markers, the A1C. And of course, you can see that it takes time for this to happen. It's one of the things I tell all my patients. If you want a quick fix, I'm not your doctor. Because we have to change the biochemistry of the body. And you know, there's some studies out there with obesity, and probably all of you are familiar with this, but some of these people that are morbid obese, it, they've shown that some of them only have gained like 10, 15 pounds a year. But it's been several years that they've gained this, where now they're 100 pounds or 150 pounds overweight. So once again, it's not like they gained it in two, three months. Magnesium and insulin. So here's another nutrient that we look at to see if it can affect the diabetic. So we talked about chromium, we talked about magnesium. The question is, which one do we order? Or should we order both of them? Or should we order more than magnesium and chromium? And once again, I think by the end of this talk, you're gonna see that we have to look at all these nutrients together. And that's why we more or less connect the dots. And there's some very good research out there. In fact, when I was at the Endocrine Society this past weekend, what was interesting is these researchers were pulling up information or research from the 1950s and saying, look, you know, we're in the 2013, but we need to be looking at some of this old research that really tells us what was going on, and now we're really recycling it. And once again, that's what's happening. Yes, some of this research is a little older, but once again, it was very good research, and we're just bringing it forward. And I think this is one that's very interesting. When we look at magnesium, for the most part, we look at serum magnesium. Serum magnesium, there's only 1% of the total body magnesium is in the serum. And studies, independent 
studies show that serum magnesium is not the test to really order. But yet people keep ordering it and it shows that that's not the one we look at. This is a test, once again, that Dr. Nori talked about, that we look at several nutrients at one time. And like I said, I've been using this test for about 20 years and there's certain correlations that we have seen. And so here's a whole list of the nutrients and there's certain things that we find that when people have certain conditions or symptoms that I've seen these particular deficiencies and one of the things is this right here is fatigue. The number one deficiency that I see in this test when people come and say they're fatigued. You know, I've been checked for anemia, I've been checked for all these serious conditions like cancer and so on, they're all normal. But when we test them, there's a very, very high incidence of B12 deficiency. And we check the serum and the serum is normal. Often these people come to me from other doctors and they bring in all their lab work and once again, they've had serum testing done several times and it keeps coming up normal. And the other thing that we see is a B5 deficiency. This one is actually nicknamed the anti-stress vitamin. And what's interesting about this is I um, interned under a doctor, Dr. Marie Shields, and he actually wrote a book, Modern Nutrition and Disease, and he was really into magnesium. That was his forte as far as researching magnesium. And what was interesting in his book, and I think the world of him, but in the book, it says that we will never experience B5 deficiency in the United States because we have enrichment and fortification. I see this all the time. In the last three years, and I've actually been doing this with doctors I talked to on the phone, there's only been one doctor that hasn't had a B5 deficiency on this test the first time they tested themselves. So all the doctors are stressed out, okay? And so this is something that we see on a regular basis. It's also called the anti-gray hair factor. So people that gray have gray hair at a very rapid rate, and they show this in laboratory animals when they put them in a deficiency. Another thing that we see is certain correlations here with biotin and you can see vitamin K. And this is once again looking at the GI tract. We see this a lot and some of you, maybe all of you have heard of leaky gut syndrome. Uh, people are pushing probiotics. Is there a correlation with this? And this is something that we see quite often is if biotin is deficient, vitamin K is deficient. Why might that be? Because about 50% of our vitamin K and our biotin is actually made by our normal flora. And so when that flora has been disrupted, antibiotics or some other type of medication or maybe some other bacteria, that we see these deficiencies occur. And once again, those are things that are very important to correlate. So we can't just look at biotin, we can't, well, we can't just look at vitamin K, we have to look at all these. And then you see there's another correlation here with vitamin D and magnesium. And this is where when you look at vitamin D or you hear studies about vitamin D being low, is have we looked at magnesium at the same time? Because magnesium actually converts vitamin D into its active form. That whole process of hydroxylation cannot occur without magnesium. But yet, if we're looking at magnesium from the serum, which isn't very accurate, are we really getting a true reading of what's going on with our vitamin D? So, you know, you might have seen these patients, you pump up with vitamin D and you just can't get their levels up. And you say, gosh, they're taking all this level of vitamin D and why can't I normalize their vitamin D? It might be because, once again, a magnesium deficiency. And then, of course, we see here with calcium and vitamin K, there's a correlation there. One of the things that was very discouraging with the Endocrine Society this past weekend was they talked a lot about osteoporosis and they talked a lot about calcium and vitamin D. Not one talk did they talk about vitamin K. And yet, if you go into the osteoporosis literature, vitamin K is out there all the time and they didn't mention about it. And they said, okay, this is what you need to do. If you have a patient with osteoporosis, make sure you check their calcium, make sure you check their vitamin D. And yet, once again, the research shows that vitamin K alone can cause a osteoporosis or osteopenic state. One of the things I mentioned that the symptoms that this patient had was fatigue. Of course, how do we measure fatigue? You know, everybody has a different level of fatigue. What about cravings? And you can see cravings for sweets, okay? And I hear this all the time that when I, you know, if I'm not eating or if I'm just sitting at night, I just have this craving. I want chocolate at night or I want something sweet. Well, this particular patient, you can see that we saw that there was a correlation. And, it, and on this test, this part right here says glucose-insulin interaction, and this actually tells us about insulin resistance. Well, one of the things 
based on scientific literature we know is chromium affects that. And I showed you a slide with that. Well here this patient had this and has cravings for sweets and yet had this insulin resistance but doesn't have diabetes yet, doesn't have hyperglycemia. All those tests are normal tests but yet once again they have. Since we've tested this patient those cravings are gone and we've corrected this. And so this once again shows us that there's scientific literature showing that chromium is involved with the insulin receptor and this test confirms that she had some insulin resistance but yet it didn't show up on our so-called standard tests. And here's this, of course, an indication of that is insulin and vitamin D. There's a lot of research. This is one topic that was talked a lot about in the Endocrine Society last weekend about vitamin D and diabetes. And what's interesting about this is these people that are having surgeries done are people that are prone to having vitamin D deficiency. For example, people that are taking prednisone for some condition, maybe it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or something like that, and they become vitamin D deficient and they start having glucose problems. Well, once again, is there a correlation? And definitely there is a correlation. So we have to look at the insulin and vitamin D connection. And if we're not able to correct that vitamin D, will they go into diabetes? Or once again, will they have these other uh, problems that are associated with vitamin D? So once again, some research that shows that. And there's a vitamin D and magnesium relationship that I talked about earlier. That here we are given vitamin D, but are we looking at magnesium and are we looking at the right magnesium? And are we given the right form? And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Because it's very important that we understand this uh, relationship. And a lot of people, once again, when they try to do research, they try to limit the variables. And I understand that. But there are so many connections. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I had a quick question about vitamin D and magnesium. I've noticed um, in family members as well as patients that when they're given very large doses of vitamin D, that some of them develop cramping. And when they're supplemented with magnesium, a lot of times the cramping goes away. Right. And is this somehow related? It is. It has to do with the calcium channels and there's a, that relationship. Absolutely. There's one thing that it's a classic sign and I have a patient that we just resolved this with. She came to me about six months ago and she has facial twitching every day for two years. And she came in, I looked at her initial you know, patient information form and reason for visit, facial twitching. And so I went in there and I said, have you been to a neurologist? Have you been to all these? And yes, 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 yes. She told me she'd been there, brain scans, everything was normal per se. And I said, well, that's a classic sign of magnesium deficiency. She said, you're kidding me. I said, no, oh, no, when you have facial twitching. I said, when I taught at the university, I used to tell students, you are going to have facial twitches right before midterms and right, be right before final exams. And they'd say, why? I said, I'll tell you when we get to that point. And sure enough, they'd come up and right before midterms say, oh gosh, my eyes twitching. You know, what is it? I said, go home and take some magnesium. And I, well, this lady, I did that. I gave her magnesium. I said, it was a Wednesday. And I forget this. I said, call me next Monday and let me know if they're better. But maybe by Friday or Saturday, they'll be better. She called me on Saturday and she's, my facial twitching's gone. She suffered two years with that. Okay. And just with magnesium. Now, an interesting thing, we did this testing and we didn't have the results yet but of course it confirmed that when we got the testing. So the point is there are some signs and symptoms that we look at and we just kind of take for granted but it comes back to of course biochemistry and the physiology but yes they work hand in hand. So here's another relationship. Here's one with of course fatigue. You see sinusitis, allergies and you can see once again we start to see some deficiency similarities. In this one right here the B5 that's deficient folic acid. Now one of the things that I want to point out here is one of the topics today is checking MTHFR, and especially in fertility uh, situations, but there's a big interest in that. Well, one of the things that we know about folic acid is it's important for making serine. And so you can see here, here's a folic acid that's borderline. And of course, this is sufficient, if you're not familiar with this test. The white part is sufficient, the yellow is borderline, and the blue is deficient. So this person has a borderline folic acid, then you go down here and you look at the serine, the serine is also marginal. And folic acid helps make that particular amino acid. So that's another correlation. Now if you just looked at folic acid, say serum folic acid or red blood cell folate, you wouldn't know about uh, the serine. And once again, there is some speculation that serine is associated with Alzheimer's. We know it's associated with the nervous system, peripheral as well as central nervous system. This is an interesting correlation. And I've been seeing this a lot <coughs> with these particular patients. And I see this a lot when I talk to doctors around the country is 
when we see oleic acid deficient on this test, that we often see a vitamin D and or calcium and zinc deficient. Now I can't tell you the reason why, but I can tell you that cellular and histology reasons that oleic acid is very important for the cell membrane. Now about a year ago, I think it was in Bone and Joint if I'm not mistaken, in that journal, that there was an article that oleic acid supplementation actually helped with osteoporosis. And I said that makes sense because when I see oleic acid deficient, I see calcium, zinc, and or vitamin D deficient. And so that would make sense that those nutrients are actually associated with bone integrity. So here you are, you have a patient that's taken vitamin D, you have a patient that's taken calcium, and you may not be able to correct or help their osteopenic slash osteoporosis. So here they go from an osteopenic state to an osteoporosis state. So now the patient says, well, do I need to take medication? Are you going to put them on bisphosphonate? Are you going to put them on estrogen? What are you going to do to help my bones? I'm on vitamin D. It should be better. But you don't have a measurement of oleic acid. And they've seen this in the Mediterranean people, of course, the Mediterranean diet, that the Mediterranean people actually have a very low incidence of osteoporosis. And they think it's because of the oleic acid in their diet. Once again, this is an omega-9, not an omega-3. And a lot of your, a lot of people out there are taking omega-3s. Some of the omega-3 supplements contain uh, omega-9 oleic acid, but you don't see that unless they specifically say that. And then once again, showing you a correlation between vitamin D and magnesium here, showing you a correlation of here, vitamin A and zinc, okay? About two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, I hear from a patient of mine that calls and says, Dr. Grabowski, I need to know if zinc really causes Alzheimer's. And I said, now where'd you hear this? Well, I heard it on Dr. Oz, okay? And of course, that day, two or three or four other patients call, you have me on zinc and you know, I'm worried about this. This is what I'm talking about. When we hear things like that is we can't just look at one nutrient. We have to look at how they're working with one another. And this is an example, and this is well published. If you have a zinc deficiency, you have a better chance of a vitamin A deficiency because zinc actually makes a protein called retinal binding protein that carries the, the vitamin A around the body. So people may show signs of vitamin A deficiency. One of the conditions, one of the signs of vitamin A deficiency is night blindness. And if you go in the literature, it's well documented. But you go in the zinc literature and zinc deficiency also causes night blindness. So the point is zinc works with vitamin A. And so if you just gave vitamin A for night blindness but the patient actually had zinc deficiency, not vitamin A deficiency, you wouldn't correct that. You'd have to correct the zinc. And like I tell my patients, if your car needs gas, don't give it oil. That you have to pick out the right nutrient. And how do we do that, okay? If I went to a doctor and I had a family history of elevated cholesterol, any good physician would say, okay, let's check your blood to make sure that you have elevated cholesterol before I give you a statin or some other medication. I don't think any good physician would say, oh, I'm just gonna put you on a statin, okay? So if a person has signs of a nutrient deficiency, why should we say just take that vitamin or just take the mineral? Shouldn't we do some diagnostics to really see what we're doing? And once again, do the diagnostics that are going to tell us what's really going on. And that's the whole point about this, is finding something that's reproducible, something that's going to tell us really what's going on with this particular patient. Here's a case where you can see this is an antioxidant measurement. This tells us if the person has oxidative stress going on in their body. It's called spetrox, and once again, you can see this person has this. One of the main uh, nutrients that affects that is glutathione. If you go in the literature, sometimes glutathione is known as the master antioxidant. And you can see this patient has a bad antioxidant status here, and glutathione is low. Athletes have a huge incidence of this. I mean, the tendency for athletes, especially your, you know, your high-performing athletes, your marathoners, your triathletes, your uh, professional football players and soccer players, and I'm going to show you some research uh, and also some data on this, that we see this all the time and we talk about oxidative stress. One of the things we're finding out now with athletes is when you exercise really heavily that you actually can cause leaky gut syndrome. That they've actually shown studies where they've given colostrum to these athletes and goat's milk and they have some antibodies in them that actually help seal the GI tract and have decreased their 
damage to their joints and have actually affected them. Well, once again, we know that there's oxidative stress on these particular uh, individuals and this is a good clarification of that. So once again, we look at GI tract and that's why now in some of the sporting community, you see they're recommending taking probiotics when you are exercising heavily is once again to help that leaky gut uh, syndrome. Here's once again, this is a 14 year old girl. You can see that she uh, suffered with fatigue and she had a concussion. She's actually a soccer player, of course, being out there heading the soccer ball on a regular basis when practice as well as in games. And she started to have more and more fatigue. She went to a neurologist, her parents took her to a pediatric neurologist. They said everything was fine. They did MRI, CAT scan. They checked out neurologically. And according to them, everything was fine. They, the neurologist even did a serum B12 and it was normal. And you can see on this particular test, it was real low. Okay, now I can't tell you the progress of it because this is new, um, but once again, we'll see in the next several months on how she recovers or how she once again uh, responds to this particular therapy. One thing you will see on some other slides here in a second, that people that exercise very heavily often have a B12 and B5 deficiency. We see that over and over and over. And not just my patients in my office, but once again, when I talk to other doctors around the country and I see their reports on their patients, I say, what does this person do? Oh, this person is a professional soccer player. This person is a professional hockey player, a basketball player, something like that. And you can see here's another correlation with, of course, the calcium and the vitamin D, okay, that we need to look at. And you can see how they correlate. We know they're uh, synergistic with one another. The point is, do we have a measurement for that? Same girl, once again, you can see now, this is a little different. This is why it's so important to test, okay? She hasn't been exercising recently because of her fatigue and concussion, but her glutathione is very good. And look at that right there. See how high she is? And that's an optimal, almost optimal status. And look at her spectrox. So we know there's a correlation, there, but one of the things we do know about athletes as well and stress is vitamin C gets depleted. And we see that, and there's a lot of research on marathoners and vitamin C deficiency. So here's an individual, her antioxidants are pretty good, but there are a couple that are on the edge, but they're not enough to really affect her spectrex because her glutathione is so good. So this is why we can't just say, okay, we're gonna go and give you glutathione or N-acetylcysteine or something like that. She has other issues, okay? We know that vitamin C is a natural anti-inflammatory. It's a natural antihistamine, and so maybe that's part of the healing process that she's needing that particular vitamin C and she's depleted. Selenium and thyroid. How many of you have relatives or patients that have said, you know, doc, I think you need to check my thyroid, or I know my thyroid's normal, the values, but I'm still tired, my hair's still falling out, my skin's still dry. I hear that all the time from doctors around the country when I lecture to them. They all raise their hand, they laugh, they go, oh, I have patients like that, I have patients like that. Okay? And then what's interesting is you test these patients from a nutritional standpoint and you see some deficiencies that are related. And about five or six years ago, the Endocrine Society was, the, the conference was in San Francisco once again, and one of the big talks at that time was selenium deficiency and thyroid, that they saw a very strong correlation with that. And you can see that there's a lot of research that has been done. This is just a small amount, but there has been a lot of research with selenium. Selenium is required to convert T4 to T3. So if we just look at the TSH, and I've seen this in a lot of patients where the TSH is normal, but then the other, the T4, the T3, the T3 uptake, and those things are abnormal. So we have to look at all of it. And once again, you can see that the relationship with this, and I see this quite often in my practice. Patients have thyroid issues, they are on thyroid medication, they're not feeling good, their thyroid panel is good. We do this test and we see selenium deficiency, we treat them with this deficiency, and all of a sudden they feel better. Histologically, you can see that they found with the thyroid glands selenium deficient animals, they showed some fibrotic process occurring. Once again, here's another correlation. We can't just give them selenium. So do we give all our thyroid patients selenium? No, 
we need to go out there and say what other deficiencies may be present that may affect these patients. And once again, zinc's related, iron's related, B vitamins are related to the thyroid hormones. So we have to look at these, and zinc's a very tough nutrient to look at from a serum. In fact, if you look up the literature in serum zinc and whole blood zinc and plasma zinc, most people say it's not a very good test to look at zinc. And then once again, showing you zinc and thyroid gland. Think of this, when we talk about diabetes, we talk about insulin receptor. When we talk about thyroid, in order for the thyroid hormone to work on the nuclear receptor, we need zinc. I have a very personal interest in this nutrient here for this reason. My mother has hypothyroidism. She's been on Synthroid for years. And a couple years ago, she came to me and she said, Ron, she says, I feel terrible, I feel weak, I'm just tired. And I said, Mom, you need to go back to your doctor and check your thyroid. She said, I just came from there. He said, everything's fine. My values are normal. I'll fax them to you. I said, well, it's time for this spectra cell test. And so we did it. And the only deficiency she had was zinc. And I love my mother to death, but she's a tough cookie to treat. And so I gave her zinc. And about four or five weeks later, she calls me out of the blue at my office and said, I just want to tell you, this may be in my head, but this is the best I have felt in months. And she says, that doesn't make sense, being, giving me zinc and making me feel better. Well, look at this, okay? There's a lot of research on zinc and thyroid. And her values were normal. They, everything was, the TSH was normal, the T3 was normal. They were, not, they were marginal in some of the values. But the point is, we know there's a biochemical relationship with zinc and thyroid. So, here's a person with thyroid issues. Now, it can't always be, once again, we just can't go and give zinc to people that have thyroid issues because it may not always be that. But the point is this, is here's an autoimmune condition this lady has, of course Hashimoto's, and she has hypothyroidism. She had mono at, at 13 years old, you can see at this age. One thing we found, and there isn't a lot of literature on this nutrient, but asparagine, this particular amino acid, I see a lot with autoimmune diseases. Cancers I see a lot. I see it with people who have allergies, whether they're airborne allergens or also uh, food allergies, but we see it very often. And then, once again, you can see a relationship that asparagine, once again, thyroid, and calcium. We know that's a strong connection. But here, once again, you can see oleic acid, calcium, oleic acid, zinc. Now, the zinc isn't deficient yet, but it's getting down there to the point that it's almost in the marginal level. But there is a correlation. And then, of course, you can see here the vitamin K um, is the GI tract. And as I mentioned earlier, look at biotin and vitamin K. If you go in the scientific literature, they're showing now that the GI tract, if it's abnormal, is setting off a lot of autoimmune diseases. Lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, we see that all the time. In fact, there was a study that was published a few years ago where they took these rheumatoid arthritic patients and just gave them a probiotic. They didn't give them any vitamins or minerals and the joint pain and the swelling went down with just a probiotic. And people say, well, how did that happen? Well, once again, it affected the GI tract. And this is an example, and we see this quite often. Like I said, there's a lot of examples I could show you that we see the biotin and the vitamin K. Here she is, once again, look at this. Her glutathione is marginal and the spetrox. It's not the only one, of course, that has an effect, but it has a, it's a very strong effect. And now, what do we do? Do we give glutathione? No, glutathione is only absorbed about one to three percent. We actually give cysteine that converts over to glutathione. And you can see this patient has a cysteine deficiency and we need to correct it. So if we give them a product called N-acetylcysteine, we will actually convert it into glutathione and both of these will go up. And here's the immunodex, which is the initial part of this test. And once again, if the antioxidant status is low, we have a hard time with this particular um, finding to be normal. Now, these next few slides are professional soccer players. And I'm not going to tell you which professional team uh, in the United States, but <clears throat> I talk to this dietitian at least once every two weeks. And we usually go over about five or six cases. She also has a professional baseball team that she uh, takes care of. Um, and what's interesting about this, and her name is Danielle, and, and she's been 
looking at these patterns as well as I have for the past several months. Once again, I told you that athletes have a tendency to have a B12 or B5 deficiency when we stress the body out. Here's a correlation right there. Look at this. We showed you that study with the mice and vitamin D and fatigue. Well, think about these soccer players. They're constantly running. And look at the vitamin D status. Okay. Now, here's the oleic acid, calcium, zinc, vitamin D. This is why we can't just order a vitamin D, or we shouldn't just order a vitamin D, or we shouldn't just order a calcium or a zinc, because there's so many correlations. And I can guarantee you, if you don't treat this, these are going to be very hard to treat. And so we have to look at that. And once again, if you go back to your histology days and look at the cell membrane, the cell membrane has a very high content of oleic acid to it. And that's very important. And then, as I mentioned earlier in a um, slide, we showed you the connection between magnesium and vitamin D. And look at this. So here this, and this athlete actually has a high incidence of muscle cramps. And the calcium levels were normal, okay, on the serum, but you can see they weren't normal here. As I mentioned, we can't just look at one nutrient and assume that if this is low or abnormal, that that's going to be abnormal, okay? So in this case, this particular individual, their other antioxidants or his other antioxidants are actually making up for the overall oxidative stress. Now, should we correct these and should we look at these and bump these up? Absolutely. But it may be his selenium, it may be the vitamin E, the alpha-lipoic acid that is really protecting his cells from oxidative stress and not just the glutathione. But generally speaking, I can tell you that glutathione has the biggest impact on the Spectrox test right here. But you can see that here is an athlete that, and this is in nutrition literature as well, that athletes have a high amount of oxidative stress. And we've seen that with the antioxidants trying to, once again, fight this. I have, a, I have three boys, uh, 18, a 16, and a 12 year old. My 12 year old is uh, the athlete of the family, per se. And he, I won't even let him play sports unless he does this test. And it's interesting because I believe this test also picks up genetics. And I've tested all three of my boys, and two of my boys almost matched my blood work um, exactly. And the other one did not, it almost matched the mother's blood work. But the point is that. These are things that we see in deficiencies. And once again, being in sports, seeing the oxidative stress, we want to catch it early. Once again, this is also a professional soccer player. When do we order, or when should we maybe order an MTHFR? Because once again, is this important? And are we just looking at folic acid? Well, if you look at these nutrients here, every one of these nutrients that I have connected, except for B5, is in the methylation pathway. Your B2, your B6, your B12, your folate, choline. Now, serine is also in the methylation pathway, but you see that this athlete doesn't have a problem with serine, but has a problem here. So we should maybe look at the MTHFR and see if there's a genetic mutation that's abnormal that may affect this particular individual down the road. And then, once again, you can see that there's some connections here and this is oxidative stress. There is an enzyme in the body called superoxide dismutase. And there's a lot of research on athletes and superoxide dismutase and what affects it. Well, these three nutrients, mang uh, manganese, zinc, and copper, all affect that. And once again, kind of try to combat oxidative stress. And you can see that his overall antioxidant level is down. He has some other issues, cysteine, and that's the only one on this particular page. Here's another one. Th all of these people are on the same team, okay? These are all professional soccer players. And you can see, it almost looks identical, doesn't it? It almost looks like a repeated that particular. But you can see that there's definitely some differences, and yet there are some similarities. Here's a vitamin D that's not quite low yet. Same thing with magnesium, but where is this person going? Are they going towards that deficient state? And once again, here's a choline. And here are some abnormalities with the methylation uh, pathway. Once again, vitamin B12 and panathenate, common deficiencies in athletes. In this particular individual, once again, they only have one nutrient that, in this particular 
panel that they've actually shown to be you know sub or marginal once again pretty good status here so all these other antioxidants are really protecting the cells or trying to protect the cells this is something that uh, a cardiologist called me a few months ago and we were talking about different things and uh, he was talking about possibly giving this patient magnesium he says you know he said the literature says that this condition I'm trying to treat should help from magnesium, but the serum magnesium level is normal. And so I just ran into this company, Spectrus, I want to do this testing, and sure enough, magnesium deficiency was there. And the reason why I'm showing you this line here is this happens all the time. And th this is old literature, but we also see it now. Hydrochlorothiazide, we know, depletes magnesium. But one of the things that we do is if we give magnesium and we don't watch B1, it can cause a B1 deficiency. It can actually induce like beriberi. And so if you supplement with magnesium and you don't watch B1, you can cause a cardiomyopathy. So you can cause wet beriberi or dry beriberi. And so whenever you look at magnesium or if you happen to supplement or patients come and say, I'm taking magnesium, you have to ask yourself, are they pushing themselves into thiamine deficiency? Now, this case, that person is not there yet, but I'm just showing you that there's a connection. And the question is, ask yourself, do you check thiamine on patients if you've given them magnesium? Okay, because magnesium actually phosphorylates thiamine. You can't make B1 into the active form without magnesium. Now, what affects magnesium? Diuretics, it can be, like I said, hydrochlorothiazide, alcohol, caffeine. I don't know about here in Detroit, but in Houston, Starbucks is huge, okay? And people are drinking Starbucks all the time. And these people are walking around with their shoulder, you know, their muscles up here, and they're wondering why they're stressed out. And they have headache, migraines, or, you know, muscle spasms, and so on. And we often test them, of course, they have a magnesium, whoop, excuse me, magnesium deficiency. So that's, once again, something we look at. Now, this is a good example. He doesn't have a problem with vitamin D yet, but if he doesn't correct this, he eventually will, and that's when the muscle fatigue can come into play with this athlete. And once again, you can see the B12 and the B5. You know, when I see these patterns come up over and over in certain conditions, or in this case, high stress athletes, you know, um, it makes me wonder, you know, that more and more of these athletes should be looking at these things, especially if they want to extend their careers or not get injured or heal when they get uh, injured. So once again, you can see that there's an abnormality here. There's some variable uh, levels here of the antioxidants. There's other antioxidants on the previous page that actually affect it as well. So here's another one just to show you the pattern, okay? These were all done within like a week, okay? So, so all on the same team. And once again, how can this keep showing up with these athletes if there's not some validity or some trends that are occurring with our athletes? I was telling Dr. Nori uh, earlier today that I, had a, I did some research on some football players in Georgia a few years ago, and this one football player, he kept cramping, and he had to get IV'd every halftime in college. And I got to this team when he was going between his junior and senior year, and the NFL was looking at him, but they were very weary about uh, drafting him because he was cramping all the time. And so when I went over there to do some research with this test, he said, I'll be the first one to give you blood. We did, and he had choline deficiency. And we supplemented him in his entire senior season. He had zero cramps, never had to get IV'd. And yet he suffered for three years in a row with muscle cramps. And when we think about muscle cramps, we think, of course, of calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. And he did all that. You know, he made sure he drank on the sidelines as far as the Gatorade and the you know, different things. Uh, once again, the IV, but he had an underlying choline deficiency. And if you go into the sports nutrition literature, they show you that choline deficiency will cause muscle cramps. But yet, a lot of people don't even think about that. Okay. Once again, just showing you some things. Now, one of the things I'm seeing uh, in athletes, whether it's the soccer players, uh, baseball players, football players, is a lot of them are showing chromium deficiency and some other mineral deficiencies, but chromium's coming up very often, and I'm seeing some insulin resistance, and of course that makes sense because chromium affects that. And you say, how can a person that runs around all day long have insulin resistance? 
Well, if you have a chromium deficiency, if you have a magnesium deficiency, that can happen. And do we want to wait till this athlete, you know, retires and he's 35, 40 years of age and he develops type 2 diabetes because of an underlying deficiency? Or do we want to try to address it early on? And once again, this is all supported with the peer-reviewed literature. So once again, it comes back to what Benjamin Franklin says, okay, an ounce of prevention is with a pound of cure. And I think that's one of the things that I really try to emphasize to my patients, and I know Dr. Nori tries to do the same thing, and probably the rest of you in this room, but we need to emphasize that to our patients, is we want to catch these things before they occur, especially if you have a family history of some of these conditions. So I'll open up to any questions that you might have um, regarding any of these cases or other cases that you may have interest in. I use zinc glycinate, okay? In fact, can you, can we, Deb, can you grab that book there, over here, right here? One of the things that's really coming out in the literature, because you might see patients like this, they come in, they're taking Centrum, they're taking um, uh, maybe uh, Theragram or Costco brand or something like this. This book just came out in 2012. Now, if you don't like biochemistry, <laughs> don't buy this book. Okay, this will cure insomnia. Okay, but if you love biochemistry, as the clinicians in here, this is a great book. This book is, of course, you can title, you can see the title is amino acid chelation. There are different forms of nutrients out there, and they have found, and this is actually a pharmacist that wrote this book, but he goes back and searches all the literature and talks about the mechanisms of absorption of nutrients and so on. The chelated forms are the best absorbed forms. And they don't interfere with other things in the in food. For example, like your grains have products that are called phytates. If you take calcium carbonate, which is very common calcium, calcium carbonate, that salt will actually bind with phytates and you won't absorb it. So here's a patient that takes calcium in the morning with oatmeal. You might as well throw most of that calcium out the window because that's where it's going. It's going to bind with that product. I see this all the time. In fact, I was lecturing in Connecticut uh, a few months ago and an OBGYN was in the audience and we were talking about CBCs and how so many doctors look at a CBC and they say, oh, you're low hemoglobin, low MCV, oh, you need iron. And they start popping these patients with iron and they didn't check the ferritin or they didn't check an iron profile. And then these people get constipated with the iron and of course the doctor says, well, take fiber with it. Well, if they're taking an iron like ferrous sulfate or ferrous succinate or one of those other products that's not a chelated iron, it will do that. So here they take Metamucil, they take oatmeal in the morning with their prenatal, talking, since we're talking about OBGYN, and it locks up that iron. And so here's this woman that goes down through the entire nine months of pregnancy in a microcytic hypochromic state that she doesn't have to be in because she was given the wrong iron. Or, not, or they say, take more iron, and they keep pumping more iron. So now the patient's into a really high dose of iron, and they got gastritis now. And so now they're not happy because they have gastritis from all the iron, and they're constipated, and they're gain gaining weight because the baby's getting bigger, and it causes problems. And that's what this pharmacist in this book talks about, how different forms can be taken during those times, and it doesn't cause constipation. You get a better utilization. You correct those common things on like a CBC or those other profiles. But talking about that, zinc glycinate is the same thing. Is glycine is the simplest of all amino acids, and they have found that that particular amino acid, when it's hooked onto a mineral, is stable and has a very high bioavailability. And that's the term that we talk about today in nutrition is bioavailability. For example, you give something like iron and ferrous sulfate, you have about a one to maybe 10% absorption, 10% the best. You give a iron, what we call bisglycinate, you get about 35% absorption. So three times better absorption with a different nutrient. And this is science talking about that. And this is where really nutrition is going, is what nutrients, what forms are going to be the best to absorb and utilize. And that's why people can walk into this clinic today, be on a bunch of supplements, and they're not correcting their deficiencies. But they don't know that because they're taking a multivitamin, they're taking a B complex, they think that they're healthy because they're taking that, but it's interfering with their food, their need may be higher, and it goes back. How are you monitoring that as a clinician? Are you just saying, well, yeah, that should be taking care of it, just like going back to the cholesterol thing. Oh yeah, that you know, 20 milligrams of Lipitor should be adequate. Well, is it? Well, let's check cholesterol and really see if it is. 
So it comes down to diagnostics and it comes down to, you know, what are we doing with patients? What are the patients doing? And are they really accurate like we think they are? I said, I've been doing this for 30 some years and I can tell you, I was trained on the basic testing and I thought that was the way to go. And we found out, you know, we advanced with it. That's why, of course, all of us doctors in this room know. That's why we have continuing education, okay, is to learn new techniques, to learn different things. And, but if you really want more information about the bioavailability of nutrients, I would highly recommend this book. And it's by CRC Press. Um, like I said, it just came out in 2012. Okay, any other questions? Well, thanks for your time. Hopefully, I've stimulated something as far as your interest in nutrition and prevention. There's information out there on these nutrients uh, and how these deficiencies can cause problems or how they can help or how they can aid in some of the medications. And if people are on medications, are we causing any problems that we can help resolve with combining the nutrition with the medication? All right, thanks for coming.